My name is Cynthia, former champion of the Sinnoh Pokemon League. Several years ago, I lost that title to a prodigy with outstanding battle aptitude. And since then, I've been training to better myself and my team. Last week during an archaeological dig, we discovered evidence of a notional realm housing knowledge outside of our conventional time and space, some place between reality and imagination, intersecting with untold parallel worlds. I can't be certain that the caretaker inside will let us stay for long, but if I could ask him one question, I only want to know who I should train alongside next in order to grow closer to becoming the best. Um, Tyler, this folder is full of ten-year-olds. Technically, I think most of them are eleven, if that helps. Hello, I'm Tyler, this is the Imaginary Axis, and the world of Pokémon really needs no introduction. I mean, have you seen this stuff? It's everywhere. Anime, manga, card games, plushies, cell phone apps, Happy Meals, the highest grossing video game series of all time. Heck, I don't know, put them on an airplane or something. Whether you were around for their big start in the 90s or not, it's clear that within the last two decades, Pokemon has gone from a childhood craze to a staple of international pop culture that everybody kind of knows and accepts in this timeline. There's just something about the concept that draws people in. A world where you can explore wild yet oddly familiar landscapes and befriend hundreds of mysterious creatures with unique powers and abilities. Devise your own strategies, train for the top, take down rivals, and together become the greatest team the world has ever seen. The Pokemon League doesn't care about your age or your looks or whatever happened to your dad in any of these games. In this reality, all that matters is pure skill. And the friends you made along the way. Each installment gives players a genuine opportunity to become the very best Pokemon trainer in the entire region. But that does kind of raise the inevitable question, doesn't it? Who's the very best in all the regions? Pretty much every game takes the time to highlight a new location filled with a bunch of new powerful trainers and their teams, but as a result, there are a lot of characters who just straight up never meet each other depriving us of that big climactic showdown we all want to see. So after considerable amounts of research and playing through every single Pokemon game, I've decided it's time to give people what they've been asking for. Or at least what a dedicated few of you have been asking for. A video focused on finding the most powerful Pokemon trainer of all time. Oh yes, there have been so many. Young gamers have been stepping into their shoes for generations. But despite what each story might want you to believe, not every champion knows what it's like to be the strongest. Because in the end, only one person can be the very best, like no one ever was. And today we find out who. But it might actually be easier than you'd first suspect. I mean, don't get me wrong, no matter how you slice it, doing a head-to-head -head comparison of every trainer across the entire Pokemon world might strain even my patience a little bit. But we're looking for the absolute strongest. And as long as we focus on the mainline games, that actually gives us a pretty short list to work with. Ancillary material like the anime, manga, and various spin-offs won't be considered for this analysis because they tend to take place in different universes with different rules. But each main game in the series features a definitive champion who systematically decimates every other trainer in the entire region over the course of the story. That's right, I'm talking about you, the protagonist. And there have been a lot of yous throughout 25 years of Pokemon history. These are the characters each player takes control of when they load up the latest version. This guy? His name's Kalem. Or whatever else you decided to name him in Pokemon X and Y. This girl? Goes by the default name Gloria in Sword and Shield. And these two? Well, they have been called Ash and Gary in official material before, but we're gonna stick with the names Red and Blue for this video since we're leaving the anime out of this. Each generational protagonist is easy to overlook because none of them really talk much, but unlike most champion comparisons out there, I actually think it's really important we keep them in mind for this one, even if they are mostly blank slate children for the audience to project upon. They all have unique stories, designs, relationships, and even a personality if you look hard enough, but most importantly, each one of them is indisputably the strongest trainer in their region by the time their respective game is completed. They're defined by the opponents they've beaten and the obstacles they've overcome, so in a way, these could serve as reflections for the individual games themselves. But still, with all the player choice involved in each trainer's unique path across a typical Pokémon playthrough, you'd probably expect there to be a real lack of data for me to work with when comparing these guys. Everything from the Heroes team to the Rivals team depends on choices made by... you. But after looking into it, I actually experienced the opposite problem. That being, there was so much information about each character's canonical skill level that I wasn't quite sure where to start. I mean, how do you determine the strength of a trainer's team? Do we use the various in-game stats? Overall type balance? How many legendary Pokémon they've battled? It's... unclear. 
So in the interest of answering this question as definitively as possible, I've devised a total of three methods for determining a team's strength, with each one rooted in a different core element. And together, they'll not only give us what we're looking for, but they'll give us one of the clearest pictures of the Pokémon series as a whole and how its world changes depending on your perspective. Just keep in mind that this is all based on the canonical narrative of each version, the steps a player must take to complete the scripted story and central post-game events. Yes, I recognize that you could theoretically lose to the final boss, run around in circles without getting your starter, or train every Pokémon up to level 100, but I obviously don't have any way of accounting for your personal copy of the game. So we'll be sticking with the plot for this one. Anyway, let's get into it. The first and most obvious method for measuring a trainer's skill level is by looking at the levels in their party. Like any RPG character, a Pokémon's relative strength is indicated by a single catch-all number that rises as you defeat enemies. It's consistent, it's easy, it's been like that in literally every Pokémon game, and if we treat these levels as objective, in-universe indicators of a Pokémon's power, they actually make the question really simple. Who has the highest level Pokémon? Whoever it is, that's our champ. Of course, there are a lot of trainers whose teams don't have any definitive levels because the player can't battle them, but they'd just be defined by the highest level opponent they've beaten. And if those are the conditions we're working with, then trainers, it's time to dust off your radio and pack some escape rope, because our answer lies in the Johto region, from Heart Gold and Soul Silver. At the time of this video, Ethan and Lyra, the remake Johto protagonists, hold the distinct honor of having canonically defeated the highest level NPC in Pokemon history, Red a former protagonist himself. And specifically his Pikachu. Red's party consists entirely of Pokémon you'll encounter without fail during a Pokémon Yellow playthrough, provided you talk to all the characters. And in case you need a refresher, this is what their levels look like. Yeah. Guys, these games were released in 2009, 11 years ago. And I searched all over canon just to be sure, but the franchise hasn't introduced a single team with Pokémon this buff since not counting special, optional challenge modes where levels are kind of pointless anyway. There is one other version of Red who acts as an unlockable boss in the Let's Go series, with a higher average level across his team, but it's unclear whether or not that battle's canon, and those games don't line up with Pokémon continuity at all. There's also this kid, Binga, who again, has a higher average level, but only carries three Pokémon. And even taking both of these guys into account, nothing in the franchise tops this Pikachu. It's the highest level opponent to ever appear in a trainer battle. Its attack and special attack are also double a normal Pikachu's, giving Red an even higher base stat total than his Let's Go self, who has a Mega Evolution. So if levels are supposed to be objective power estimates, then Red is objectively the most powerful final boss in the entire Pokémon series. And these kids had to beat him to finish up their map and earn that ultimate credit roll. Just to give you an idea of how clearly intentional this all was, during the original Gold and Silver, Red's team looked like this. A little weaker, but still the highest level Pokémon you could face at the time. So what caused the devs to add this random power bump into the remake? Well, I actually think the answer lies between the two pairs of games. You see, nearly nine years after the original Gold and Silver, Pokémon Platinum dropped. And this version gave us the very first trainer with a team even more powerful than Red's. Barry. You know him, you love him, and if you don't, he's gonna find you. This kid's the main rival throughout the Generation 4 series, like Diamond and Pearl, and while he's always a step behind the protagonist, it's only in Pokémon Platinum, at the very end, that he resolves to challenge you to a fight every weekend you're available in Sinnoh's survival area. At first, his team looks something like this, but if you defeat the Elite Four ten times, he'll challenge you with this. Defeat them 20 times, and he'll fight with this. 30 times, and, well, nothing changes past 20, but he already has the highest level Pokémon in the region by that point, so maybe he deserves a break. When this game was released, Barry became the most powerful Pokémon trainer you could fight in the entire franchise, even surpassing Red. But that all changed again only one year later when Gold and Silver came back for a remake. So it seems to me that this mysterious level bump given to our first-gen hero immediately after someone flew past him was a deliberate choice by the developers to demonstrate a difference in trainer strength. They're keeping Red at the top intentionally, telling players he's the ultimate obstacle to overcome. He's the biggest final boss in the series, and it's not incidental that nobody's held a higher level since. But there is one trainer who had to beat him at his absolute best to complete the journey, either Ethan or Lyra, depending on the timeline. In fact, we can actually go a step further and use the final boss of each version to develop an unofficial tier list of the most powerful trainers in the series according to the level method. Ethan and Lyra sit at the top, and their main rival is actually pretty close to the bottom. Weird. Seems fitting. But you know what? Pokémon's more than a casual number game that people play on their smartphones while waiting in line at the dentist. We're talking about an entire fantasy world here. 
a reality filled with people, societies, scientific laws, and structure, it's not exactly hard to argue that levels only really exist for the player. Like when a character tells you which button to press to jump. That's not strictly canon, is it? There's no absolute clinching proof that these things scale across time and space from one game to the next. They could be kind of arbitrary and meant to represent an abstract sense of progress or difficulty. In fact, a lot of world building even suggests that each region's very best trainers are at least somewhat comparable to each other. Joey and his top percentage Rattata aren't going to take on the champion anytime soon, but Steven Stone losing a battle to Lance? Or even champions losing to sitting gym leaders? That sort of thing's treated as a real possibility, despite the obvious level gaps. A lot more emphasis is given to planning, coordination, and trust when talking to anybody experienced in the Pokémon world itself. So if battling is less about numbers and more about strategy, then who's the strongest? I like to think of this question as similar to MMA fighting or boxing. I've never been a super fan of either sport myself, but it's no secret to most that under normal circumstances, the top 10 best fighters at any given time are all basically within range of one another when it comes to their full strength. Those blows hurt, no matter who's being hit by them. And while the heavyweight champion might not have to worry about some guy far down the rankings, he has to go all out and pay attention when fighting rank number two, or three, or four, or five, six. One wrong move could cost him the match. He's ranked high because he's strong, but he's ranked that high because he knows how to fight. In universe, Pokemon is treated like an MMA match with six fighters on both sides. Maybe the world's strongest Charizard isn't going to be all that different from the world's second strongest Charizard. But what matters is their style, what their trainers taught them, and how they coordinate the battle what their team looks like, what attacks they know, who covers for which weaknesses. And if there's one trainer in the entire Pokémon world who understands strategy, it's Cynthia, champion of the Sinnoh region. Huh? What? In the spirit of effective research, I actually took the time to review every recorded lineup, along with their stats and moves, for each champion in the series, as well as a few miscellaneous trainers typically regarded as around the same skill level. And guys, the results were indisputable with this one. Cynthia the Sinnoh Champ has the most balanced and strategically sound team by a long shot. But Leon does come in a respectable second. Yeah, it turns out the Invincible Galar Champion is more than just a lot of talk. This guy deals heavily in offense and speed, meaning his plan is usually hit hard, hit fast, and cut through your entire party before you can even think. His lineups are built to cover their weaknesses as much as possible, keeping his opponents on the defense so he can push forward quickly. You have a water type for his Charizard? Well, that Charizard knows Solar Beam a move specifically added to take out water types. And he only has 19 weaknesses across his most balanced party. That's pretty impressive, usually forcing even prepared trainers to stay on their toes. But just for the sake of perspective, even Cynthia's worst team reduces that number by five. That's over a quarter of all weaknesses, gone. She even gets the number down to 10 in some cases, while Leon's can go up to 26. And every Pokemon on her lineup always comes packed with cover moves too. Like, these two guys are weak to fire, right? And fire types are weak to ground, rock, and water. Just try approaching Cynthia with a fire type. I dare you. She always has a variety of stats across the board, she's not afraid to switch out to gain the advantage, and she likes to lead with a Pokémon who isn't weak to anything, so she can read her opponent and start with a counter in the next round. There have only been three Pokémon in series history to not have a weakness to any type, and Cynthia owns two of them. You can actually get a sense of her chess-like approach to battling just by looking at how well she covers herself. While some move choices are… questionable, Cynthia's teams aren't far off from what you might have actually seen in real-world competitive battling back in her generation. See this Togekiss? Thunder Wave paralyzes your Pokémon, giving them a 25% chance of not moving. Air Slash is a pretty strong attack with an extra 30% chance of making the opponent flinch and skip their turn. And Serene Grace passively doubles the odds of additional effects like that. Meaning if this thing hits you with these two moves, there's a 70% chance each round that you won't get to attack and she'll just whittle down your health until you faint. Leon may have had an undefeated record, but if you ask me, Cynthia looks like she's just been at it longer. It's implied she's been the champion of her region for quite a while, and she has trouble remembering the last time somebody even posed a threat to her. These are probably the most strategically intimidating lineups ever offered to a protagonist by an in-game trainer with canonically top-tier strength. And each one has its purpose. If Pokémon's an MMA match, you're looking at the heavyweight champion of the world try out four different styles of combat. And you know what? All of them failed. Presumably to prodigies even more skilled than Cynthia. 
And it took me some time to work out which trainer took down the toughest matchup. Her teams are very consistently strong. But after running some numbers, the Sinnoh champions, Lucas and Dawn, win it by just a hair. I actually find it interesting that Cynthia claims the first Unova protagonists remind her of these guys. Because when using her teams to estimate the skill levels of both trainers, they're incredibly close. I'd even say that Hilda and Hilbert probably beat Lucas and Dawn when using the Platinum lineup, but it came down to this. If Cynthia's teams have any consistent weak point, it's likely their speed. You're going to land a hit on her, and these guys are just barely better at taking damage than these guys. Lucas and Dawn also had to work their way through the Elite Four before facing Cynthia, while Hilda and Hilbert had access to more Pokémon in their game and could fight her at any time. But it's admittedly really close. If these two battled, Team Unova might win four times out of ten. Which brings us to our final method of analysis. You know, one thing we didn't take into account for this video was the Pokémon World Tournament. It's an optional challenge you can take as Nate or Rosa in Black and White 2, and it involves fighting most of the champions from previous regions. Problem is, this contradicts the definition we established for canon. When you lose the Red fight, or any of the Cynthia fights, the story is interrupted. Your character blacks out, wakes up in a Pokémon Center, and has to challenge those trainers again to get the credit roll or small bits of narrative. It's the same as every other battle in the game. At the PWT, though, losing just causes the competition to continue without you. You were eliminated, and winning doesn't really unlock any special scene or even minor story either. Whether Nate and Rosa won, lost, or competed at all is relatively unclear. And the same can be said for basically every legendary Pokémon encounter up to Generation 5. For those unaware, there isn't really any distinct criteria for what classifies a Pokémon as legendary, other than, well, somebody saying it's a legendary Pokémon. But they're usually rare, ridiculously powerful, and related to the main conflict for whatever version you're playing. Meaning our heroes encounter them a lot. Most Pokémon stories include some sort of confrontation between the main character and a legendary Pokémon. But throughout the first four generations of games, the canonical result of those conflicts was always left fairly ambiguous. Just like the PWT, there were dialogue branches for capturing them, defeating them, or running away. No real answer. But that all changed in Pokémon Black and White. During this game, and every game since, it has been necessary for the protagonist to capture at least one Legendary if you want to experience the full story. In other words, most heroes parties may be in a state of canonical flux due to player choice, but at least one slot is definitive for each kid past Gen 4. These trainers have gods on their teams. The story demands it. And that's really important. From one perspective, sure, you can technically take out Arceus, the creator of the Pokémon universe, with a Magikarp if you train it properly. But from another perspective, that's just a mechanic to make the game playable and not ruin the meta. Within the lore of Pokémon itself, there's absolutely no reason to think even a really good team could take on a legendary like Regigigas, for example. This Pokémon supposedly towed the continents into place. Even the strongest of its non-legendary counterparts are only credited with causing earthquakes, destroying mountains, or annihilating cities. This is leagues beyond that. And when our heroes battle legendary Pokémon as part of the plot, the game usually gives us some reason that they weren't completely obliterated. It likes the protagonist, it wants to test his strength, it was distracted and left early, you powered it down first, unfused it, it couldn't control its power, another Pokémon intervened and nullified it. Some might say that if we want to find the strongest trainer, these are the only Pokémon that matter. So whose team canonically has the strongest legendary? Xerneas and Eviltal have limited control of life force in their surrounding area. Reshiram and Zekrom can destroy the world according to multiple sources. After Mega Evolving, Rayquaza became powerful enough to shatter a meteoroid that would have annihilated the Earth. But you want to know which team really shoots past the others? Which trainer has the strongest Pokémon by a mile? Well, believe it or not, it's these dorks from the Alola region. These total goofballs, Elio and Selene, currently have the most powerful canonical team in Pokémon lore, and it isn't even close. For those of you who might need a refresher on the games these two come from, the main conflict in Ultra Sun and Moon centers around a Pokémon from beyond our universe called Necrozma. Apparently back in ancient times, this creature lived in a sort of dimension between dimensions, known as Ultra Space. And it was brimming with so much energy that it lit up entire worlds like a sun by simply shining through the wormholes that led to other realities. But one day, people from a specific universe got greedy and tried to take the Pokémon's life for themselves. They weren't successful, but they did manage to seriously injure the poor thing and put it in a state of constant pain. Necrozma responded by flying into an uncontrollable rampage, destroying everything in its path, searching for any light it could find across the multiverse in hopes of regaining its original form. And this thing was powerful. The people who provoked it couldn't stop it, so they locked Necrozma inside a shining tower and closed off all contact with other universes so they could spare those realities from the monster they'd created. 
countless years later, that tower is weakening. Necrozma's going to escape. And coincidentally, you've just moved to the Alola region to set off on an adventure of self-discovery. There are too many details and plot twists to go into right now. Apparently the ultra-strong Z-moves are just small fragments of Necrozma's power. But needless to say, the story ends with you saving two worlds minimum, winning the League, catching Necrozma, and basically being gifted a Pokémon overflowing with energy that can restore Necrozma to its original form under the right conditions. You also get a love interest, eat Malasadas, and tell some interdimensional supervillains to buzz off. Not bad for somebody who hasn't even finished unpacking yet, but the real thing to pay attention to is this guy. See, when I first heard that Necrozma was lighting up entire worlds, I realized you could probably figure out how much energy it was giving off if you defined a few variables. Specifically, distance. I wanted to know how much of an area Necrozma was illuminating in its prime. And while my playthrough of the game wasn't totally clear on this and left me with a few questions, the original Japanese script was more explanatory, pretty heavily suggesting that our glowing legendary just lit up all of Ultra Space, and maintaining that it never physically traveled to any other worlds to just light them up in person. This is also how the manga describes the events, and I know I said I wouldn't use the manga earlier, but this isn't a team specific to that continuity or anything. It's literally just the legend from Ultra Sun and Moon restated with less ambiguous language in the English translation, so I don't consider it a bad secondary source. Either way, if we want to know how strong this Pokémon is, we need to know the size of Ultra Space. So I looked into it and came up with a few numbers. First of all, in every translation, Necrozma provided light to at least a few different worlds, so I measured the distance between Alola and some common Ultra Wormhole spawn points to estimate how much the Pokémon was illuminating at an absolute minimum. It came up to around 1,400 light years. If we instead assume it's providing light to all of Ultra Space as implied, we know that area is at least 7,000 light years wide, because there's a mini game that lets you explore Ultra Space, and you're pretty much guaranteed to run out of stamina once you get that deep, because the game stops providing fuel. Then for our biggest number crunch, we can use the stars and nebulae in the background to estimate that Ultra Space isn't any smaller than our own observable universe, and it's usually treated as its own dimension. So if we put these three numbers into a formula for calculating the luminosity of stars, then we should be able to come up with a range detailing the Chrosmus energy output, and... Good grief! This Pokémon from Ultra Sun should be capable of annihilating the Sun according to our lowest possible estimate. At our highest estimate, a full-powered attack from Ultra Necrozma would destroy the solar system, and it wouldn't stop there. The explosion would travel 4.37 light-years all the way to our neighboring star system, Alpha Centauri, destroy all three of its stars, and consume the planets over there, too. No wonder Elio gets all the ladies. If you wanted to make a proper comparison between these six trainers, you'd first need to realize that our second place contenders have only ever dealt with global threats. Then you'd need to realize that if the sun were the size of a basketball, the globe would be the size of a sesame seed. The kind you see on sandwich buns. This Pokémon hits so hard that even if you cut it in half, back to Necrozma and Nebi, they'd still have enough power individually to bench all these legendaries with minimal effort. I couldn't find anything suggesting even one of these guys could destroy the sun. Except for maybe Eternatus, if we cheat and give it its Eternamax form? The Galar Pokedex says that form has infinite energy, but due to the narrative I'm like 99% sure it means an infinite supply of energy, like a battery that never runs out. There's nothing suggesting it can hit you with infinite energy at once. The Pokedex says the same thing about Necrozma, and the two legendaries who stopped Eternamax don't have anything implying they can blow up the sun. If I were from Galar, I'd go legend hunting before taking on Alola's living Death Star, but that's just me. So, there you have it. Three different methods for finding the strongest Pokémon trainer of all time. One champion for levels, one for strategy, and one for Pokémon lore. I know some people might be dissatisfied that we don't have just one answer, but part of the reason I couldn't choose between these three was because none of them are perfect. Each has a few issues and a few merits, but all things considered, I think that's actually a better representation of reality than the alternative. We each have the ability to decide what it means to be the best, and there's no single answer. Whether you're making a flawless team, catching the strongest Pokémon, or battling the highest level trainer, the real fight is against yourself. You always have the potential to make it to the top, but you have to decide what that looks like. Maybe that sounds a little inconclusive, but you're the protagonist in your version of the world, and the best thing about any game is that there's usually more than one way to play it. I need to stop traveling to other dimensions. Trainer Tips. Hit the subscribe button to see more Imaginary Axis content in the future, and ring the bell for notifications. If you liked this video, maybe check out our channel to see more. We've got a Twitter, Facebook, in the description. Leave a comment telling us who you think the best Pokémon trainer is. But everything else aside, thanks for watching to the end. I really appreciate it, this was a fun video to make, and I have many more coming soon. Have a fantastic day.